Welcome to Change BCM. I'm Sean Murphy. We have the pleasure to speak with Mark Buchanan, the author of Ubiquity, Why Catastrophes Happen. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Sean. It's a pleasure to be here. Before we get started, can you give us a little bit about your background? Sure. So um, I'm a physicist by training. Uh, I got a PhD at the University of Virginia in the States. Um, I used to work in plasma physics, uh, which is you know, nonlinear dynamics and relevant to fusion energy and stuff like that. Um, then I uh, got an opportunity to be an editor at Nature, which is an international science journal. So I worked there for a couple years in London, judging physics manuscripts and in the sciences. And you're still the editor. Uh, no, not at Nature. I uh, okay. work. I write a column now for Nature Physics. I got you. So Nature has a lot of spin-off journals in different fields. Okay. Uh, but um, after Nature, I then worked at New Scientist, as a, which is a more popular, um, kind of like Scientific American, but in, mm -hmm. in Europe. I was a features editor there. And then I went freelance, and I've been writing just as a freelance uh, author for the past 10, 15 years. I just try to find interesting themes in science that I think are emerging, um, and where the sciences teach us something of relevance to you know, practical economics and, and policy and, and then try to, or try to write about it in a way for the general public. So what inspired you to write the book? Okay. So um, I was, when I was working at Nature in the mid-90s, uh, I was you know, immersed in all the, the latest work in physics. And you know, if you think of physics, most people will think of you know, the origins of the universe, quantum theory, Albert Einstein, of course. Mm -hmm. um, was Albert is, Einstein a physicist? Einstein was a physicist, okay, of course, okay. yeah, one of the, one of the greatest. <laughs> um, and that is, that is physics. There are physicists who are doing that today. But most physicists by far work in what's called condensed matter physics. And this is the physics of you know, ordinary stuff, this material. Mm -hmm. What's the structure like? Why does it have the properties it has? Um, why is one thing a liquid and another thing a solid? And it's all about the organization of all those molecules and how they interact. What happened in the mid-90s is physicists realized that their, their science was, wasn't really just about physics. It was about organization. It's, it's deeper than physics in a way. They were doing applied mathematics of how systems of many interacting things um, develop organization and patterns and certain kinds of dynamics that, are, that you can understand. And this applies to even things like traffic flow and the way cars interact with each other, the way species interact in an ecosystem, uh, the way people interact in a crowd. And so what inspired me was this realization that physics is kind of more than just physics, traditionally interpreted, that it applies to social systems or may apply to social systems. Um, so that, that to me was very exciting. And I started uh, thinking, you know, this is something that more people should know about. And when I looked into some of the, the, the work in social sciences and, and you know, the philosophy of social systems, I found that, that most of the work was happening was kind of totally ignoring recent developments in physics. Their, their interpretation of, of ideas about dynamics and change and the, the typical kinds of change you should expect in the world we're all based on really old physics, you know, mm -hmm. cycles and trends and really simple ideas. And I thought, you know, it's a shame that they don't, don't know about these richer concepts of patterns and dynamics coming from, from really new physics mm -hmm. that could give them tools to think about change in human societies, in history, in, in social patterns in a much more, uh, I think, realistic and, and powerful way. Yeah, to have so, an impact to anybody. Potentially, really, yeah. yeah. So I just thought I'd write a book and try to bring that to a, to a larger audience. So was it part of your thesis, is getting your doctorate degree? or it's, it was, Totally, it totally separate. Totally just no. I epiphany on, as you're walking down yeah, the street yeah. one day. And well, I guess it was, it was a lot of the papers I was, I was reading when I was uh, dealing with new papers that were submitted in Nature. Okay. trying to get background and all, all this new work was then was coming out then and it was a very exciting time for physicists in that area and I got you know swept up with the excitement yeah, cool. if you had to give an overview of the book what would what would be the high level overview for the readers? okay I guess one way to think about it all right we've had this recent financial crisis that has dominated the news and um, you know the way it's typically interpreted in, in economics is that uh, the, the economy is kind of a stable system it's in equilibrium and then occasionally it gets hit by some shock, and then it's perturbed for a while, and then it comes back to some new equilibrium. You know, they think of the economy as a thing that, that will be in a state of balance, unless it's perturbed from outside. Um, and if you go back through history, you see the stock market has this horribly erratic ups and downs and huge crises every 10 or 15 years of one sort or another. This is true in economies around the globe. And you, know, you have to wonder, there, there's two possible interpretations. One is that well, economies are these stable systems that just keep getting whacked from outside. Mm 
We just have bad luck. Right. Uh, or we can blame somebody. Right, you can blame somebody. That, this weird thing happened, we weren't expecting it, but that's okay now, now it's gone back to its stable equilibrium. The alternative is to ask the question of, maybe it's not you know, things that are hitting the system from outside, but maybe these, these convulsions and these upheavals and these sudden changes are part of the ordinary kind of, kind of weather of the economic system. They arise just like storms arise mm -hmm. in the atmosphere out of perfectly ordinary um, you know, properties and dynamics of the system. Um, all right, so that's, that's one thing to think about. And, and what I, what I, starting point in the book is that if you look at economies, if you look at ecosystems, if you look at human history in a larger sense, if you look at the way electrons flow through certain solids or the way fluids flow, you find the same kind of pattern over and over again in each different setting. You find these histories that are, that are kind of, you have these long periods of relative quiescence, which are then you know, kind of upset by something. There's this big up upheaval, and then quiet, and then up upheaval. The upheavals are very um, hard to predict. They're, they're scattered about in an apparently random way, and they just seem to come out of nowhere. And this, this kind of pattern of dynamics typifies these complex kind of systems of many interacting parts in lots of different areas. So, so the book is about trying to understand um, if there may be a more general explanation for why you see the same kind of pattern arising in totally different systems. Mm -hmm. Why traffic flow looks a bit like the dynamics you see in the stock market, and why that looks a bit like the dynamics you see in the way electrons flow through a solid or the way ecosystems behave. And right, I won't get into some of the mathematics. There's this the particular signature of, of the, the underlying dynamic, which is called a power law, that shows up in all these systems. And it's numerically very similar from one thing to the other. Um, even though the, the systems are, are you know, the underlying dynamics and things involved are, are very, very different. So I wanted, to, I wanted to, to, to bring out in my book you know, how things that seem really complicated may have some underlying simplicities. And if we understand some of those simplicities, we can learn to anticipate the kinds of future we should expect. It may not be a kind of safe, comfortable future we would like. Mm -hmm. It may be highly erratic, hard to predict the next upheaval, because that's the way the system works. It has upheavals built into it and unpredictability built into it. But if that's the case, so be it. We should mm -hmm. understand it as it is. Accept it. Right. So really, uh, the idea that instability or disruptions are natural we Absolutely. should expect them, and actually, times of calmness is actually not normal in a way. Or, Absolutely. Or not, Absolutely. It doesn't need to be stable. And in fact, I mean, one of the best examples is, uh, I guess, given the analogy, in the analogy sense, is, is the earthquake. So earthquakes, people have studied earthquakes for centuries. We still can't predict earthquakes you know, with any degree of accuracy. We know earthquakes you know, range in size over you know, like 10 million, a factor of 10 million in terms of their energy. Most of us think about an earthquake as, as the really big event that shakes the, the buildings. Mm -hmm. But earthquakes are going on all the time. If you had a sensi sensitive enough device, you'd find that there are earthquakes going on right here, right now. They're just below our, our threshold of, of sensitivity. It turns out, though, that, that if you look into the dynamics of earthquakes, those little ones, they're just the same as the big one. They're just smaller. The kinds of things that are happening are exactly the same. It's just rocks breaking apart and sliding. It's just the really big earthquakes involves a lot more sliding along a much bigger fault than the small ones. But they're the same kinds of events. They're not qualitatively different. I really, I really to interrupt you, I really enjoy uh, this part because when, in our field, we look at crisis management, instant management. Instant management is kind of the small disruptions that are always occurring. And for us, if you do, and to your point, it has the same characteristics of a large one. So a small tropical storm or wind storm has the same type of capabilities or characteristics as a hurricane or a cat, cat three or four. And so when you look at, when we look at engineering organizations from a, from a business continuity perspective, this monitoring or tracking or understanding these small near misses or small mishaps or incidents that are happening in the organizations, then that gives us an idea of how resilient or brittle we are for, um, based on these particular uh, characteristics. So it gives us an idea of what, what the characteristics of it right. to help right. us prepare for the big one which is what right. we deem as a crisis that could um, So the smaller cripple. incidents you take is they're, they're poking your organization, yeah. probing it, and you can see how the organization responds. And yes, exactly. Testing it, in a sense. And testing it, and you, and you get to learn right. um, you know, the, before the big one hits. And right. so we're able to use that knowledge to, um, anyways, to build resiliency in the organization. So, yeah, very fascinating on that part. Um, so if you, if you had to say, like, if I was going to, 
to the to the uh, readers and the listeners. If if you had to take your book and you had to teach me three things that I was going to talk about at a cocktail party tonight, you know, you wanted me to embrace and to say, listen, Mark Buchanan, here are the three points. What would the three points be? Okay, I think the first is that um, we've been tr our, our minds have been trained to when we see a big event in the world, some cataclysm, a big earthquake, you know, some kind of stock market crash, we think. Well, it's such a big event, such a dramatic event, there must have been a big dramatic cause of some sort. Something terrible must have happened to the economy. Maybe somebody at some big firm, you know, tried to trade, you know, 100 billion worth of something and they hit the wrong button and did the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. um, something dramatic must have happened. Or when that big earthquake arises, you think, my gosh, there must have been something catastrophic that happened in the earth, totally unusual, that made that big thing happen. It turns out what, what science is telling us is that that's not the case. There's a, there's a radical break between cause and effect, and we need to think about cause and effect in a different way. Many systems are just configured in such a way that large events can happen at any particular moment. They start out in just the same way that the small events start out. There's nothing that you could see beforehand that would have told you that a big event was just about to happen. You could have scoured the details in as much as you want. You'd have never seen that there was something just about to happen that was gonna be really big. And yet, that is always possible. And why it's big has to do with an, an almost infinite number of details about how particular bits, elements of the system linked together, which made it possible for one thing to set off a kind of huge avalanche of cause and effect all along the chain. And so I think the first thing is we need to rethink cause and effect. And that's, that's a very deep thing because we're not used to doing that. It's almost, we always look for event explanations. So the earthquake happened, we need an explanation. And that explanation is, based on our mental models, and so your rule number one is we gotta change the way we think about these, which what you're saying is they happen all the time, and it doesn't have to be event-driven, it could be system-driven. Right, yeah. The system is such that these really large events are going to happen occasionally, and there's no particular explanation for why it happened now in this particular setting. There's no, you don't learn anything by thinking about it that way. Mm -hmm. To think about it properly, you need to think about the whole system and realize that the system is configured in such a way that these really big events come out occasionally. And knowing that, then you can maybe try to take some steps to protect yourself against those uh, eventualities. The second lesson, I think, is that we need to accept that the world is much more irregular and erratic and prone to disruption, continuing disruption, um, than, we, than we tend to think. Um, you know, we like to think that the world is in some sense ordered and we can live it in a, in a comfortable way and that the past is a sequence of periods of calm that are just broken apart by some external thing that gets in the way and, and disrupts things, and then things go back to normal, and there is a normal that we can count on in the long run. What I'm saying is there is no normal, that the normal is continuing in disruption, and not only continuing in disruption, but disruption in a way that, that lures us into thinking that it's not disruption. Right? There's periods of calm broken apart by kind of burst of, of chaos, and then there's another bit of calm, that has another burst of chaos. And the periods of calm are unpredictable in their length. How closely together the bursts of chaos happen is unpredictable. And yet this is, the, this is the pattern we see over and over again. And that we think there are good theoretical reasons why many systems uh, in nature and in and human systems evolve to become just like this mm -hmm. in order to have this, this kind of erratic behavior. So it's almost, you know, humans are we're so good at planning for success and planning for growth, like market share, brand expansions, and you know more revenue and so forth. But we're very bad at planning for failure. We don't uh, right, these irregularities. Right. We don't really do a good job of managing them. Yep. And in a sense, again, go, going back to changing your mental models, if just if we learn to expect them, and then properly build that resiliency in the system to be able to respond appropriately. Right. Well, the third third take home point I think is that you know, gets on to the matter of how we can behave in, in such a world. Um, if the world, you know, has this, this erratic pattern and irregularity built into it, and it kind of lives on the, on the very edge of predictability. It's not that it's totally unpredictable. It's a little bit predictable. We can see patterns, and we can start to, to act on those patterns. But they're ephemeral patterns. They're not going to last. And we're, we're drawn into thinking they can last. Um, and that's what often leads to, to big mistakes. Um, to live in a world that is on, it's kind of poised on this boundary. It's not ordered. It's not total chaos. It's in between. It's just a little bit of pattern, 
but always disrupted in a way that, that is really rich and interesting, but a bit scary as well. To live in, in that world really means we need to focus on being adaptable, being resilient, being able to respond quickly, never getting ourselves stuck too much into one particular idea or one particular plan because that's likely to be disrupted in the near future, even though it might work out for the next 40 years, you don't know. Um, so it's a peculiar world to try to, 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 to make informed decisions and make plans because it, it's, it lives in this nether world of predictability and unpredictability. And I think, you know, as I say, it's, it's, it's a scary place to be, but it's also what makes the world fun and, and interesting.